Welcome back to CHE 205. In this video I'll be talking about chapter 7 of the textbook, Regression Analysis and Parameter Estimation. So we're gonna start by talking about if you have a bunch of points, let's say uh, xi and yi, xi is the x-coordinate of the point and yi is the y-coordinate of the point and i uh, represents the index which means let's say we have 10 points then our i can go from 1 to 10 or the n sub d which means number of data points okay for every i for every point we have an x and we have a y such that if you plot them uh, if you plot the y as a function of x we see let's say five points if n d is equal to five right so this is, uh, well, here's x1, here's x2, here's x3, and uh, correspondingly we can have y1, here's y2, here's y3, and so forth, right? So we have a bunch of points. And let's say for now we want to draw a line that best, that fit these points the best. Okay. So the way we do this is for every point we calculate the residual ri, which is the difference between the one we calculate or the one we fit and the data point. So our fit definitely doesn't go through all points because if you think of a straight line like this, okay, it never goes through all points because if it goes through all points, it's not gonna be a straight line. It's gonna be like curved line like this, right? And because it doesn't go through all points, for every point we're making some error. And this error, let's say for this point, is the distance between the data point, the y of the data point, which is this y, this height, and the y that is uh, predicted by the line, which is a little bit lower. Like at this x, the, uh, the, the line is a bit lower than the y of the data, and the difference between the y of the point, or the y of the prediction, and the y of the data point, okay, the difference is going to be the error. Right. In other words, uh, if we draw a line here, uh, okay, and let's make it red. So here's red. So the difference between, or the distance between these two lines, is going to be the error that we are making for this point, right? So the prediction should be the top line. Sorry, the, the exact data is the top line. The prediction is the bottom line. The difference between these two is the y difference uh, between the exact data and the prediction. Okay. The same way we can go ahead and calculate the error for a residual for every point. You're going to call it ri. Then we, we squared all the ri's and we sum over the i. And we get half of it. We call this q. Okay. This is the total uh, sum of the residual squared. Then we want to minimize this error, this Q, right? Using the uh, concept we learned from chapter nine, the optimization, we're gonna minimize this Q. And to minimize this Q, you have to get the derivative of the Q with respect to the parameters. Let's say the parameters are in the function we assume for the fit. Okay, the Y calculation is a function of all the x values in let's say some parameters c1 to cn. Okay. Then we have to get the derivative of the q with respect to the parameters c1, c2, c3 all the way to cn. And these c's you can think of like if you need, if you really want to fit a linear function, then the prediction would be or the y calculated would be something like c1 plus c2 times x, right? In this case, C1 and C2 are the parameters. So with this with this idea, you can think of the prediction as a function of x, uh, as a function of C1 through Cn. That's, in general, we can have n parameters. Anyways, so when you get the derivative of the Q with respect to the parameters to minimize the error, you basically do something like this. So derivative of Q with respect to all parameters, C1 all the way to Cn, and for every Ci or Ck, you get one equation, which is the sum of ri, dri, dcj. This is like derivative of the sum with respect to c. So you have to take the derivative inside. Derivative of this is going to be, the so two is knocked down, so you cancel with this two. So you get ri, dri, dck, and the sum over r the i. Or dri and dc, and this should be d actually ck, not cj. I mean, you're 
taking the derivative with respect to CK, so this should be CK, not CJ. Anyways, um, okay, so you get this. Basically, you get for every CK, you get one equation. If you have n CKs, then you get n equations here. Okay, so then what do we do next? Um, then Then we, let's say from, so we get a set of equations, n equations, n unknowns for C, we can go ahead and solve them. And then after you solve, uh, the we, we do basically something like um, uh, Taylor series, okay? Let's say the residual we had, like this, right? So the residual is we kind of start with some guess value for the C parameters and then guess value uh, gives some residual and then we can correct that guess to find really the and the true values something like Newton's method, right? So the uh, the variation in, in C that gives us the correct solution should be taken, um, should be given actually by the derivative of the residual with respect to CK times some change in the residual, uh, some change in the parameter. So basically, this is the Taylor series of the residual with respect to the parameters, right? And then from here, we can we can find how much we have to change the CK uh, to get basically to minimize the error, basically to solve these system of equations. There are n equations here, right? And so to solve these n of the, these n equations. We basically uh, follow the uh, Taylor series, and from here we find delta C, which is going to be, um, well, and th this is valid for, uh, this is valid for every i, right? So we can vary i from one to i sub, uh, sorry, from i equal one to n d, right? And then basically substitute this equation 7.5 into this equation, right? So our i now is in terms of delta ck. And if you plug this in there, you get this equation where delta ck is what we're looking for, is how much I have to change my c from the initial guess to get a ck uh, or some ck that satisfies, uh, that satisfies these set of equations. Okay, so by doing so, by substituting 7.5 into 7.4 into here, we get an equation like this, where from here we can solve for delta ck. All right, so by simplifying this equation, let's assume and, and delta ri, delta ck can also be written as a function of uh, as a function of derivative of f with respect to ck because ri is yi calculate minus y data, you take derivative of this with respect to ck, derivative of that is zero, because that's data point, that's number. You have to take derivative of this with respect to ck, which means derivative of fi with respect to ck. So all of these actually boil down to uh, derivative of f with respect to ck, let's call that zk. Okay, and by just uh, plugging this delta f with this, well, df dck into here for delta ri with respect to ck, we end up getting an a system of equations like this, right? For every, uh, for every, uh, for every j, we can write this equation. So at the end of the day, we get a system of equations like this where we have to solve for delta ck. And these are basically nothing but the ck that gives us the minimum error. So how do we calculate this, uh, this this system of equations? All we can all we can uh, solve, or all, all we have to actually find, is the elements of the coefficient matrix and the elements of the right hand side. So the book calls them uh, well. Starts with a uh, with a variable z sub k. And then, depending on how many parameters we have, if you have three parameters, we have three z's. If you have two parameters to solve, we have two z's. Okay. So, and by definition, z 
let's say zi is the derivative of, or zk is the derivative of f with respect to ck. Okay, so I think it's, it's better to start with an example to see how that comes about. Let's say we want to fit a linear function to some data points. First, we calculate z1 and z2 because there are two parameters, we have two z's. We calculate z1, which is derivative of the equation we assume for the fit with respect to the first parameter, c1, which is 1. And then z2 is going to be the, the derivative of the, uh, the equation we assume for the fit with respect to the second parameter, which is c2. Again, dy cap dc2 gives us xi. So now you see that z2 has a subindex of i. If you have five data points, then z2 has five elements. For every i, you get one z2, right? Because z2 is xi. So now you would see why we have summations over all these elements here and there, because z in general is a function of i, is a function of data points. For every data point, you have a, you have a different z. Okay. So then we're going to form the matrix. So the first element of it is z1, z1, sum over the elements. But z1 is just constant. And so this is going to be sum over 1 times 1, because z1 is 1. So we have to go over all data points. So our data points, we have, let's say, 10 data points from 1 to 10. Okay, and let's see, uh, do we have the data points? Let's say the data points are these. We have the air velocity, that's the x values. We have uh, the evaporation as a function of the, the, of the air velocity. If you have a liquid, we know that liquid is evaporated quicker if we blow air on it. Okay. And so, so here's the experimental data. For every x, we have the evaporation maybe speed or, or coefficient or something like that. Uh, and that's going to be the y. Okay, so we have 10 data points here. And for every data point, we have to calculate the z. So we calculated z1. Well, z1 is constant, doesn't depend on the data points. And we did the uh, sum of z1 times z1. Okay, we have to sum over 10 points, so it's going to be 1 to 10, 1 times 1. The second element of g is z1 times z2, and then summation over i. So z1 is 1, z2 is going to be xi, so it's going to be 1 times xi, sum over i from 1 to 10. That means sum of the x values here. And this g matrix is symmetric, so this element is exactly like that. And the last element here is the 2, 2 element, which is sum over z2 times z2, right? So it's sum over, well, actually right here, sum over z2 times z2. And we know that z2 is xi, so it's going to be sum over xi times xi, when i, is, i goes from 1 to 10. So this is going to be squared of sum of, sum of the x values are squared. So it's pretty much suited for Excel. We can go and create a column for x can uh, sum the elements in the column. We can create a column for xi squared and sum over that column and put the numbers here. So by doing so, we have the G matrix here. Now we have to go and calculate the right hand side, which is ri times z1, z2 all the way to the end. Let's look at that one. So z1 is 1, so ri times z1 is going to be just ri, right? And um, and so Ri is going to be, by definition, is going to be calculated Y, right, minus Y of data. Uh, so this should be at point C1, C2 equal to 0. So because of that, Y calculated is going to be 0, because when C1, C2 are 0, then Y calculated is 0. So this Ri is nothing but minus Yi data. Okay, and there's already, already a minus up front, this minus sign here. So then minus minus y data becomes just y data. So the first sigma is going to be ri times z1. z1 is 1, so it's going to be ri. And ri, we just proved that it's yi data. So it's going to be sum over yi data from 1 to 10. So this is sum of the y values. The next element here is sum of... Uh, ri z2, but z2 is xi, so it's going to be yi xi. Okay? All right. So the only point here is that the ri that you put here in the right-hand side is going to be the ri for 
the parameters assume to be zero. So when you have C1, C2, you put them zero, then you calculate R.